Well, we'll, we'll make a, a, an official start at this point moment. So um, as I've been saying, it is so good to welcome you onto this call. Um, we were just saying uh, just pre, uh, as people were coming into the, the call that it, uh, I guess many of us are suffering a little bit from Zoom fatigue, um, but we're also very aware that for these sorts of moments, it's a really helpful and useful platform where we can connect from across uh, the country, uh, but also uh, internationally as well, where we have Bev with us from Australia. Um, and I'll introduce Bev in a few moments. Um, and it's just great that, you know, we, we didn't have to get up at 5.30 and get on a train and travel somewhere to be here for 11. But um, I know it's not the same as being in person, but it's a great opportunity to connect. And as a leadership team, um, just to let you know who's on the call, um, there's Pete Everett, um, uh, Ali Summers, and Amy Waring uh, here. And is Adrian on the call as well? Have I seen Adrian? Don't know if I've seen him yet. Um, Mark Elder sends apologies. I think he's on holiday this week. Um, so we're so glad to have this opportunity just to spend a little bit of time together, to pray together, um, but also, um, as you keep hearing, and I'm sure we, we were a bit tired of this, but you know, when we sort of thought of this theme of Back to the Future, which was um, about 12 months ago, when we started to sort of think about the 2021 conference, and we were sort of making that decision, do we, do we stay online or do we not stay online? Do we do an online conference or do we not? Um, Nobody would have perhaps imagined that here we are in June 2021, still in some form of lockdown, still not back into any sense of real normality of whatever that is in terms of church life. And the sort of themes that we were exploring in our conference in 2021 around that theme of back to the future um, are still as relevant as ever. So we just thought today it'd be great to just have this call uh, hear a little bit from um, from Bev, from Alex, and from Mark, who were all contributors at the 2021 conference. Uh, just to hear a little bit from them on, on their sort of ongoing reflections uh, around that that thought of Back to the Future, and um, so what I want to do is uh, just share with you a verse in a moment or two, but. Um, I do want to just welcome uh, Stephen and Mel, who are our BSL interpreters uh, on the call today. Um, one of the things that we at Fresh Streams have really been um, reflecting on since conference is our desire to be a more accessible um, to the deaf community. And so we do have some members of, of um, the deaf community and the church at uh, Stafford, I think particularly, on the call, so welcome to you and welcome to Stephen and Mel, uh, who are uh, signing for this uh, call. Um, that means that we won't be spotlighting um, the speakers. Um, you can do that yourself if you want to do that, or you can keep it in gallery view. Um, but we're using the multi-pin option, which gives that ability for the individual to control uh, so that they can multi-pin uh, themselves and see the speaker and see the interpreter at the same time. Um, so uh, when you go into breakout rooms, you may uh, be in a room with an interpreter. So just be aware of that in terms of uh, the breakout rooms as we use them during this call. If you remember the verse that we used as the theme for our 2021 conference was from Jeremiah 6 verse 16. This is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. And we've been really reflecting on that verse and as, as I'm sure many of you have, of that sense of being at a crossroads. Um, and I think we still are at that crossroads. And so um, that's what I've asked Bev and Alex and Mark, just to keep 
reflecting back from their perspective and, and we'll have some opportunity to be in breakout rooms to share with one another and also just to have one or two uh, questions and answers. If, if there's things that you want to ask as we go through um, today's call, then do use the Zoom chat facility um, that's been monitored by Pete and if, if we'll pick up any questions a little bit later. But we want to, at this point, just put you into um, some small breakout rooms. We just thought it'd be great to connect, um, just pray together. Um, they're gonna be done randomly, so you don't know who you're gonna end up with. Um, but it, we just thought it'd be great just to connect in that way and to find a, a, just a few moments to, to just to pray together and, um, and just to commit this time to God. So um, let's do that now. Thanks, Pete. So it's a real privilege to uh, welcome Bev. Um, Bev was the um, lady who did our Bible readings and Bible study at the conference. And uh, we're really pleased that she was willing to jump onto this call. Um, Bev is based in Australia. Um, it's just gone 8 p.m. in the evening for her. Um, so Bev, uh, welcome. And if you uh, want to um, do a little bit more of an introduction of yourself, please do, but um, I'll hand over to you now. Okay, thanks, Andy. I appreciate being invited to contribute here to this large conversation because I think that's the way we know how to go forward. Um, I've been a church pastor and then movement leader for a few decades. So um, my husband and I formed what is now called the Skylark organization. And now currently I am a writer and a leadership consultant and I still am mentor of leaders, etc. So um, I was really taken with the particular scripture that began this whole conference about standing there at the crossroads. And I felt like it's an obscure scripture, but it's incredibly, incredibly relevant for this time. And, and all the more so because I believe that God has called us to who is out there to reach, not who we want to be out there. And I feel like that's a very relevant thing because sometimes we're busy saying this law oughtn't to be that way or those people shouldn't be allowed to do this. But actually, it's vital that we get a handle on the fact that we're called to the world as it is. We're not called to say, go back, we need to reframe the laws, etc. And so in that, it's really important that we be listening to the Lord and what it is that the Lord's calling us to. There's a saying that I've never been able to track down who actually said it, but it sounds like a hunting term, and it is, don't wait for the rush of the arrow. Listen for the creak of the bow. Don't wait for the rush of the arrow, but listen for the creak of the bow. And I think that the church at large has lost the understanding of what it is to listen for the creak of the bow. And so then suddenly we get hit by flying arrows and we don't really know what to do. And it, that's that's a really damaging thing for our own ability to be effective. Now, I was looking at um, the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3, and I won't read all the scriptures for you because I know that you know the story. But the Bible says that um, Eli had gone to sleep and Samuel had gone to sleep by the by the presence of the Lord, but it says he didn't know the Lord at that time. And so he heard a voice calling Samuel and he runs to Eli and Eli said, no, it wasn't me, go back to sleep. And then that same thing happens. And the third time when Samuel goes to Eli, Eli suddenly realizes this is God. And that says to me, it's been a long time since Eli heard the voice of God and he forgot that God does speak individually. There's a, a whole lot that I could say about this message, but I, obviously I'm just going to give the high points. And so the whole point of it was that at that point, the word of the Lord was rare in the land. It hadn't been revealed to him. And Samuel at that point didn't have faith as much as he had religion. And so he's up and down all the time trying to work out what it is that he's hearing and where he's coming from. But it's because there's this irritating, insistent call that is 
calling him to something outside of what he's doing now. And I believe that's happening in our generation, that there is this call to something beyond what it is that we are doing now. And um, that's, that, that's, that doesn't mean young people. It doesn't mean children. It means this generation. So whatever age you are, the Lord is, is calling. And then it depends on whether we're going to listen, whether we're used to listening, whether we have the ability to go and sit down with God and say, what are you saying? Like, what is the creak of the boat? What is ahead? How do we need to change what we're doing and where we're doing it? And so it goes on for us to think, you know, we've seen COVID-19, we've seen Black Lives Matter, we've seen the economy shafted, we've seen other people who don't seem to be affected very much at all, but our world is in absolute turmoil. And when I hear church leaders say, I can't wait till we get back to how it used to be, I feel really discouraged because we are never going to go back to how it used to be. What we need to do is find the way forward. Now, I do know that when a ship is bigger, you can't suddenly turn it a 90 degree angle because we're going to lose a whole lot of the people over the side. But we, you know, so it may be that we will go back to services as we've known them but with the intention of moving in a different direction, not just like, oh, thank goodness we're back and here's where we'll stay. But okay, this is the thing that will bring all the people in our church back to this, to this place. But now we're going to lead them into what is different and what is new. And so, you know, I know 10 years ago, people were talking, preachers were talking a lot about the fact that God was raising up Joshua's. I believe now that God is looking for Samuels who are willing to hear when the word of the Lord is rare is what it, the Bible says. And what that means is not that it's not inside the church, but it's not outside the church. And for us to go out and say, you shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that doesn't make the Lord work. doesn't make the Lord's word any more common out there. It just makes it more stressful out there. And so um, the fact that, Samuel went out there when everybody else is asleep. It actually means that what God is calling anybody in the church, and you know the scripture in several scriptures in Revelations where it says, for him that has ears to hear, for her that has ears to hear, let those people hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. And I believe that is a season that we're in now of having ears to hear, the creaking of the bow, is to hear what God is saying to the churches. And um, I think that we that includes the willingness to be able to hear the creak of the bow and change direction before it happened. And I have noticed, even in my interactions with Andy and with Fresh Streams, that Fresh Streams is really very intentional about wanting to hear what God's saying and be ready as the changes come that you guys are already there with the vehicle to be able to take people for, further. And I was thinking about Isaiah 43 verse 19, and it says, look, I'm about to do something new. Even now it's coming. Don't you see it? Like over and over again, we see the Bible saying, don't you see it? And um, he goes on to say, I'll make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And I think in terms of the understanding of our nation seeing God and, and understanding who he is, we are in a desert right now, but the Lord says that he's going to make a way. And so I think that it's vital for all of us to be willing to rethink. And I've, I read a great book the other day by Adam Grant, and it's called Think Again. And it's not a Christian book, but it's speaking about the way in which we take something on board and we live with it. And he has cited a lot of great examples, but one of them was about the frog in the kettle, which most of us have heard that if you put a frog in hot water, it'll jump out. But if you put a frog in, um, if you put a frog, you know, in cold water and then heat it up, it won't jump out. And he says, that's really a fantastic story, but it is not true. And I'm like, Yes, well, it never made sense to me, but in actual fact, we tend to take on what we already learned and what we already heard, and we don't think again when the circumstances change. 
And when organizations believe that what they're doing is the best, keeping it the best becomes the value. And that means it misses the opportunities to rethink. Rethinking can only happen in a culture that's willing to learn. And so for us, we have to know that we're never going to be back to normal. There was a, a guy in, um, in Canada who was trying to express more than a year ago what COVID was going to mean for everybody. And he talked about the fact that it's not a blizzard that's going to last a few days. And it's not winter that's going to last a few months. He said, you got to look at it like a mini ice age which means everything's going to change. And I, he wasn't a Christian, you know, he was trying to put across a technical point, but that was a really great example that we can't say when this is over because actually we're at a significant change point in history. And I heard somebody refer to it as an AD 70 moment. And of course that was when the temple was destroyed and everybody, all the Christians were scattered. And reading um, Matthew 9, verses 16 and 17, it talks about not putting new wine in an old wineskin. And I think that's the thing that's vital for us. When we're talking about you can't turn a ship uh, 90 degrees suddenly, that's the point. All the old wine lovers would fall overboard. Well, we don't want to lose the old wine lovers, but we also need to keep the new wine lovers. And that's why it makes sense, yes, maybe to return to a semblance of what we used to do, but then lead people from uh, on from there because it is a new wine season. It's a new wine skin season. We have to be willing to change. And so I think that it's vital that we get rid of the confidence in how it always worked and that we be willing to reevaluate our mission and reevaluate the community that we're aiming at and reevaluate our own organization and look at what people we have and look at the new season and look at what is needed right now and find a way to meet those needs from trusting relationships, even if it means everything changes about the team, about the church and about the church's mission. And that's a really vital thing. There's a very good article in a journal called the Praxis Journal, P-R-A-X-I-S, and it's called Leading Beyond the Blizzard why every organization is now a startup. And that was written by Andy Crouch and Ken Blanchard but and uh, Kurt Kel Kyle Hacker. But um, they are only just a, sm a smattering of what is being written now about the fact that the church needs to change and it needs to not fight to go back to what we used to be and what our morals are and what our values are because the church of Jesus Christ is called to be a voice to who is there now, not tell them they shouldn't be that. And therefore we can't really do anything with them until they stop being that, whatever that happens to be. But to be able to say to the Lord, how can I now, how can we now as the people of God Focus toward who is out there now. Focus toward working out how to bring streams in that desert. How to make a way through that wilderness so that people hear that Jesus loves them and that he is, that he is our hope. So I'm, I'm thinking that's about 10 minutes and I don't want to overdo my time. Thank you, Beth. That was uh, really helpful. And uh, just over 10 minutes, so thank you for that. That was fine. Oh. <laughs> Bless you, that's fine. Um, lots to keep reflecting on and, and please use the chat if you've got any specific questions um, as you're listening that you'd want us to pick up, but we will have some opportunity in, in the breakout rooms as well, just to reflect together on what we're hearing. And um, I'm going to introduce our second uh, contributor, which is Mark. Um, Mark is based down in Kent. Um, so uh, thanks so much, Mark, for joining us today. And I'll um, hand over to you now. Great. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, it's really, it's a privilege to share in this um, call. And I have to say, I, I loved being part of Fresh Streams conference this year and really benefited personally from all that was shared in the sessions. I'm sure many of you will have done so much food 
for thoughts. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think the word listening, just as I was listening to what Bev was saying, and um, just the importance of listening in this time. And one of the things that strikes me, and I'm sure would have struck uh, many of you as that verse from Jeremiah was read, is where it says at the end, but we would not listen, or they would not listen. And, um, you know, it just reminds us, doesn't it, of the context of the people of God, and the fact that actually we all can be stubborn. And there are so many times in my life when I haven't stopped to really listen and say, God, what are you saying? And I might have plowed on in my own assumptions um, or my own ideas or thoughts or desires, some of which, uh, you know, will stem from my own, you know, insecurity and, um, and all kinds of other things that will come into play and the importance to listen to um, God and, um, and recover what's most important and what's most fruitful in this time. And so, um, you know, I, I remember Alan Hirsch sharing about how COVID has been a kind of apocalyptic moment for the church. You know, that Greek word sort of for, for revealing and unveiling and, uh, and exposing. And that's quite, you know, that can be quite scary, especially as a church when we see the the weaknesses and the things, the vulnerabilities and the things that aren't as we would hope they are. I also want to say, though, I think through COVID, we've also seen sometimes that the areas of the church where there's much more, much more healthy and much more fruitful than we'd have dared hope as well. And that's important to recognize. And of course, it's been a, a revealing time for the, the world. And I was thinking right now, I think the church is at a vulnerable moment. Um, I think that, that um, you know, in many ways, we need to appreciate our vulnerability and our weaknesses in humility as we stand at the crossroads and as we look and as we listen, as we seek a good way, the, the good way to walk in. And, um, and I think um, it means that the only response we can have is to acknowledge that this whole thing rests on God's power and not our own, you know, and we need to really um, maybe regrasp a sense of the sovereignty and the power of God in our time and just what's possible with him and also how little is possible if we kind of try and trudge on in our own strength and resources that are so depleted, you know, and where resilience might have been so worn down and say, actually, God, we really need a fresh move of your Holy Spirit. And we really need an outpouring of your anointing. And we really need your wisdom that's so far above our own wisdom and, um, and your way, which is so much better than some of the ways we might have been walking in up until this moment. Um, and, you know, remember that actually the church is a move of God from start to finish. Uh, and it's his initiative. And he's the one building it. And I know I'm, I'm say, stating the obvious things, but they've got to hit home in our hearts in this time, don't they? Um, or else we're going to, yeah, we're just, we, well, we're just going to drift on into, into, into decline and, and maybe worse still, you know, kind of damaging ways. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that always calls us, doesn't it? When we hear the voice of God and, and when we meet with him, it calls us to have that, you know, to repentance, which I think is key. And, um, and I think also it's reminding a whole church at a, again, at a vulnerable moment that God's power is revealed in weakness. And so some of those most vulnerable places can become the most fruitful places as well. And, um, you know, as a church, we've been sort of looking at starting Renew and journeying with Renew and some of the stuff Ruth shared really kind of brought some of these thinking um, to the fore in my mind and it's been really helpful. Um, but I also think it's, encouraging the church isn't it not to we can't be sitting around looking our wounds at this time but we do have to rise up we do have to rise up and be uh, the light of the world that we've been called to be and we can do that in God's strength and with God with us and there is also in that revealing there's a harvest that I think has been revealed that we didn't even realize was there before in so many ways and I know that will work out in different ways in all of our contexts and, um, and we have to say, actually, right now, we, we've got to be able to reap the harvest that God has 
has kind of given us in this time really and has and has appointed us to bring in and the people whom who's god has appointed us to to bring into his kingdom and we can't just be we can't just be kind of spiraling down into our own insecurities and fears of the future you know the other thing with listening that came to mind i had this picture just as bev was speaking of um people in the church maybe because of the noise that's been going on and the chaos and the frenzy in our world, you know, people in the church who've just had their fingers in their ears and have covered up their ears and just want the noise to go away. And as we said, those, those words, those dreaded words, just want to get back to normal. And because they've been, you know, so tightly closed to everything that's going on, they've also closed themselves off to the voice of God. Um, you know, saying this is this is the way walking it, and they're not they're not seeing it. And we've got to, as leaders, um, find that good way for ourselves and listen through listening to God, and then be able to lead the church into it. Um, and you know, I'm sure as with many of you, some of you might like me be struggling and thinking, yeah, am I am I on this good way? Am I am I right in the the centre of this path? Because I've got to lead others in it as well, and that's a big uh, responsibility. Um, so yeah in short we need God and his power and the other thing I think as leaders we're going to need in spades um, in the days to come is discernment uh, so I think as we're not only pulled around by many agendas of people in our church and you know many things we're also even on I think even denominationally I think there's going to be conflicting agendas and priorities and battles in this time that are going to come to the fore I think we need discernment to say who are we you know are we listening to God and then also who are the people who we are listening to what's the fruit of their lives and their walk with God their desire to follow Jesus to see him glorified above everything else and um, you know no matter what the cost is and I think we need real real discernment to know um, how to how to walk in these times and um you know, I think as movements to actually get back to the DNA of what we're all about, you know, and as churches and say, okay, what's our DNA to, to really reassess and, and actually discern where we are, we're going, you know, as, um, as churches, as movements, as, as disciples. Uh, I was just thinking about um, just a few things. Again, the kind of stating the obvious, I don't have, um, um, you know, much, um, much to offer here, apart from just a few priorities, maybe. And, um, and, you know, firstly, uh, there's just no substitute whatsoever for the intimacy for intimacy with God in this time. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing worth more than our relationship with God, there's nothing more important than being renewed in his presence, and we need to be renewed. Um, and um, and if our ministry and our mission doesn't flow out of that place, then you know it's going to be like a you know like a toxic stream really um, of all of our own insecurities and fears, and and that that's going to not just badly affect us but those that we lead as well. And and so it's not going to be fruitful and life giving. But obviously, if it flows from that place, it's going to be you know beautiful and pleasing to God, and and it's going to be a blessing to others. Uh, that means that priority of prayer as churches and corporate prayer and really calling the church to prayer. And, you know, if it needs to start with just a few, which it probably will do, then so be it. You know, um, if you have leaders who are committed to prayer and to praying together, uh, then the church can follow that. If you don't have leaders who are committed to prayer and praying together, then change your leaders you know, um, you know, unless they're unless they're willing to come and to pray, because it's 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 essential, you know, um, you know, and and only the Holy Spirit can stir the church to prayer, and um, but we can start by being obedient to that stirring in our hearts, and allow the Spirit to lead us, and then we can model it to our our family, and um, and I think from that place, you know that not only will there be a growing yearning for the kingdom and God's presence above everything else, but also that will call the church to repentance and greater commitment to holiness and seed into the Holy Spirit's leading in our lives. 
Um, and that's the foundation, isn't it, of kind of renewal and move, and a move of God through us. Uh, and the second thing uh, is, um, is just a, a, a re-evangelization, if you like, of the church. I think actually um, uh, uh, coming back to the heart of the gospel that we have, this good news, um, and, and recognizing it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And I'm really, again, stating the, the obvious things, but I don't think we want to be those in Jeremiah 6 who cry peace when there is no peace, you know, which comes earlier in that chapter. And I think that's really important. You know, the gospel is powerful. You know, it's transformational. The Holy Spirit does convict people of, of sin and their need of a saviour. And, you know, we, we can't be kind of diluting some of that or be kind of snake oil salesmen in the midst of that. You know, we want to we wanna present the gospel in a compelling way with gentleness, with respect, but we can also speak truth and be prophetic in, our, in a confused world. And I think that's important. Um, and, and I think as British people, um, uh, we need to recognize that actually offending people isn't the unforgivable sin. Um, and sometimes it happens, but we, you know, we're not seeking to offend people with the message that we share. But I just think in these days that is going to be, you know, there is going to be greater, um, a greater kind of distinctiveness of the people between the people of God and the world. And there needs to be. Um, and so I just offer that. For you to weigh and to think through what that actually looks like and how to do that in a christ-like way and a, and a loving way and demonstrate the father's heart of compassion through that um but um and then and then the third thing i just want to share very briefly just finishing is about how the, as a church we need to get really 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 good if we're not good at anything else the one thing we need to be really good at is making disciples and it's the one thing that we probably have not being as good at you know as a wider church and um and i think what can help practically with that this is what i've been trying to do as a leader is reassessing kind of the metrics of how i measure my own effectiveness as a leader um i know that you know those kinds of things can be dangerous and but you know what i mean is rather than thinking about you know, things like, I don't know, Sunday attendance or amounts of people who were reaching through certain programs and all these things, which, you know, can be important, um, but also can be depressing in times like the ones we've been through and probably in the months to come. I, I think thinking about who I am personally investing in as a leader is an important one. Thinking about who I am discipling towards faith in Jesus is really key. You know, who are those seekers who I am engaging with personally? Where are the opportunities that I've had personally to share the gospel um, in the community? And who are those people who I am discipling to do the things that I do and making space for them to be able to do that? And I think as we do that and model that and coach our leaders to do the same and to make disciples, we will we will see some of the changes that we want to see. Um, and someone said, you know, sometimes we've got to go slow in order to go fast. And, you know, Jesus shows that, doesn't it, in the way that he invested in, you know, Andy's spoken at times about investing in the few to have an impact of the many. I think that right now that's, that's really important. Even as we have a tidal wave of pastoral needs, as we have, as we, there's the one that we have to go off after as we leave the 99 on the hillside, we've still got to find those disciples who we are, who we're journeying with and inputting and investing in ourselves and then create that disciple making culture across the church. Um, so having humility to learn from the, the global church where the church is most fruitful, seeing what they're doing, um, you know, learning from that and being part of that is important. But I guess just to finish, it's about desiring the real, the real thing, you know, the real authentic Christian faith, not the, you know, the people who Jeremiah addressed, they had some of that, that kind of religious frontage, but actually it was hollow and it was empty inside. But we need to find what is the good way, um, what is the real thing, what's the authentic Christian faith, how do we live that out in our context um, and, um, yeah, and, and follow Jesus in, in this time and bring others with us on that journey. So, um, 
yeah. Yeah, thanks. Back to you, Andy. Thank you so much, Mark. Again, lots to uh, to ponder, to reflect on. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, I'm going to just ask our final uh, contributor just to jump in at this point. That's Alex. Uh, Alex is based in London, and um, it's a real privilege to welcome you on the call. So thanks, Alex. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everyone. Wow, what a fantastic contribution uh, that we've had um, from Bev and Mark, it's been absolutely inspiring. So I hope that um, uh, my last few comments will be helpful. Um, I'm, I'm gonna hit a few things that I just see prophetically that I think God is kind of encouraging us in the direction of um, at this time as we're coming out of lockdown and as the church. And um, thinking about Jeremiah 6, 16, you know, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. I think it is an incredible time that we've had over the last year to be able to really kind of, when we've been locked down, to really kind of lock into God <laughs> and to listen to God and to push in to God. And, 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 and thank you for that, the, the whole thing about listening that's been mentioned uh, already today and the whole thing about intimacy, because I think it was a time to kind of lock down and a bit like a seed dying, but then bearing much fruit. I think that's the kind of season that we're in, that it's been a time to really push into God, uh, it, whether we felt afraid, whether we've been affected in terms of illness or grieving, to push into God to receive his intimacy and his comfort. So I think that's been a really important time to stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths, because it's only in the ancient paths, it's only in the going back to go, can we go to the future? Which, you know, we heard great contributions um, from, from Amy and, uh, and, uh, and others uh, during the conference uh, that spoke about uh, the, those things and, and, and Alan Hurst. And, um, and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. And that's the place of rest, isn't it? When we really know that we're connecting with God, our heart is for Jesus in the center. Our heart is to really know what God's heart is for us and we have to start in that place even if there's confusion around us at times i think it's the struggle that the eternal struggle between the not tree of the knowledge of good and evil i just need to get on it with it and react to it in my own strength and be defensive and do the best i can and the tree of life where we're actually intimate hearing from jesus responding um, out of his peace and out of his life so as we go back to the future and where I believe in this Kairos moment where God has been speaking in many different ways, I think over the last year, I mean, wow, who would have thought everything that's happened in our world just over the last year has been um, amazing, incredible, and, and very, you know, very confronting. And so as well, I think we lean on Jesus in the center, we are re-Jesusing as we heard, we, we want to re-disciple, we want to re-mission, we want to be, um, co-creators of the future with God rather than curators of the past so these things are so important so I'm just going to hit seven subjects not exhaustive and won't go on too long don't worry Andy <laughs> um, that that, um, that that some have already been mentioned before that I think things that God is doing right now so um, these are things and I have a really high view of God calling his church together, the gates of hell will not prevail against that. As we are listening to him, and as we are then declaring who Jesus is, we've become to know who we are. You are Peter, you are the rock, you, you have something to give um, to the world. So I believe at this time we have something to give to our fearful, selfish, insecure, and sometimes divided world. The first thing I see is that we are to be, as the church at this time, a great demonstration of unity in diversity. We are to be an incredible uh, thing. Already the BLM whole thing has been mentioned. And, you know, when these things rose up, I know some people felt uh, defensive, some people felt afraid and everything else. But I do believe that if we discerned it deeply, there was a Kairos moment where God was trying to say something about breaking down barriers and bringing unity and that we as the church, can be the the best demonstration of that and obviously we see that in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost with everything being broken down and people sharing together and there being an incredible unity that took place we're told that Christ is our peace and he breaks down the barriers so where better than the church to demonstrate that incredible 
unity and diversity. No one's got to be the same. We've all got to be diverse, but we've just got to appreciate difference. In fact, let's go beyond appreciate difference, celebrate difference, the multifaceted diversity of God. So that's the first thing I think that we can be an incredible um, example of at this time. Secondly, I believe that, you know, economics has been affected, um, things like this. And I, I believe that we're to bring economic answers as the church through um, social justice, through our community programs, um, through business solutions as well, to strengthen people's well-being, to strengthen people's shalom. Because shalom is wide ranging, isn't it? Shalom is, it's, it's, we could translate it in our modern word, well-being. Uh, but it's also translated, you know, that inner peace, but it's also that relational peace. It's also prosperity, it can be translated that. So I believe we as a church are to bring answers to our society to help people get reskilled back to work. I know that I've heard a lot of testimonies in the past about young people that have been skilled um, through speaking and all kinds of things in the church. It's given them a lot of confidence as they have gone into workplaces and they've begun to do well. So this is not unusual when we look at the past to look back to the future. William Booth, Cadbury's, Bourneville, Lord Shaftesbury, Wedgwood, believe it or not, biblical examples, Paul, Phoebe, Aquila and Priscilla, um, Barnabas, Dorcas, etc. Number three, moving on quickly. We need to be bold. We need to, to, and we've heard about this already, so I won't talk too much about it. Bold evangelism and discipleship. Um, and so one of the things being very involved in the turning in London, um, one of the leaders there, where we saw 1,144 people respond in prayer to the gospel on the streets. One thing it blew our minds of, it totally broke the myth that the gospel is not powerful on the streets of the UK. It just broke that myth. We now know people will respond if you share the gospel with them on the streets of the UK. Myth broken. But the next stage we found now we need to get to is having a culture of discipleship, which I know has already been touched on in the church, so that we become disciples who are making discipleship makers. And, and that's got to be where we go now in that. Um, that needs to be from the fundamentals, as we've already heard, of repent, be baptized, full with the Spirit, Jesus as Lord, etc. But that's also got to go into, I believe, the 2 Peter 1, 3 that God has given us, equipped us for life and godliness so that people in the church are being equipped in every area of life and godliness and so that both those things are happening and I won't go into anything more than that except it should be holistic mission. Fourthly, I believe we need to be undergirded with technology and I think we've all become a lot more technology savvy recently <laughs> um, with live streaming in the lockdown and I believe you know picking up a bit on what Bev was saying about we we need to be hybrid now in the sense that we need to invest finance in live streaming and these kind of things and you know there'll be people that are coming in physically to church there'll be others that will be online we found that a lot of people connected up with us online who would have never normally come to church and as a result We've seen quite a number of baptisms as we've come back and a lot of people we've seen now in discipleship. And so I think being bold to continue live streaming um, as well as being physically present and not being too worried about that. Um, and even into life groups and small groups, I think those sort of things could continue to happen. Some might be together and some might be on Zoom, but let's just allow the church kind of to be the church. Um, I think also number five, catering to our next generation. You know, it saddened me that in some situations I've heard of churches closing down. And when I've spoken to some of the leaders, they said, well, our young people are not coming as, as well as our, our children. But when I've pushed them a bit further, they've, uh, they said, well, they're going to the church down the road where the music is different and the style is different. But that's not us. And I thought, well, well why isn't it us? <laughs> it's, <laughs> Why, why sit there passively and say it's not us? Why not say, hey, young people, could you do this? Could you do that? Invest in the next generation, because I think as we should be mothers and fathers, always investing in the next generation. And I'll be honest with you, I bias. I, I'm 57, just so that 56, nearly 57. But I bias. I bias the 18, 19, 20 year olds in terms of music stars and things like that. I might not even always like it. It's irrelevant. What's relevant is the kingdom of God. And growth and if you enable and empower them then they continue to see the church grow i think i've still got a tiny bit of time andy because some of them were shifted me a bit later didn't they <laughs> so two more points um know who we are i think identity is key 
I think someone said it already. I think um, Mark, um, I, think, I think it was already said that we, Mark said it, we need to be humbly confident as the church, humbly confident because Isaiah 60 verse one to three says, arise, shine, your light has come. Not it's coming, not we're grappling after it, it has come. We are born again. Jesus is the light of the world and he dwells in our spirits. We're new creations. But what he's asking us to do is to arise and be bold in our gospel message, be bold in equipping people for life and godliness. Look at all the skills there are in the church. Let's bring them all in. Let's equip our young people so they are the leaders in our society and for the future. I'll stop there. Verse, final point, seven. Be led by kingdom principles, not political polarization is absolutely key in these days. We've seen it happen in America. I think we've seen it happen here to some degree as well. You know, some American evangelical charismatics prophesied Trump would get back into power. Um, and, and some of them missed it on the racial issues. I think sometimes here, um, sometimes we've missed it on the issues such as justice for the child in the womb. And so if we go for one issue, then we say, oh, you're a right-wing bigot, and we accuse someone of being a right-wing bigot for standing for the child in the womb. If we go for racial justice, suddenly we're, we're all raving Marxists. Nonsense. We're kingdom people that have the heart of God, that have, want justice, well-being, shalom for everyone from every race, um, tribe, tongue, generation, and the baby in the womb. Amen? Because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let's stand at the crossroads and ask for the ancient paths of God's kingdom. And that will inform us to go forward into great things. But we need to, as has been said, listen and be intimate with our God. Thanks for listening. Wow, thank you so much. Packed in so much there, Alex, thank you. Um, lots to continue to reflect on. We're going to just jump straight into some breakout rooms now because you've been sitting listening very um, patiently, uh, engaging with each of those contributors, lots to reflect on. So let's give you some time to do that. Um, so thanks, Pete. Let's open up those breakout rooms. Great. Well, hopefully that gave you some time. I uh, appreciate not a lot of time, but some time just to begin to uh, reflect on what you heard and share back together. Do, do use the chat if you've got any particular questions or reflections that you might like us to pick up as we talk, draw towards the end um, and, and maybe ask um, one of the contributors to reflect back on. But just want to take a few minutes uh, at this stage just to give you a quick update um, from the Fresh Dreams team perspective. Um, normally around this time of year we would do a little AGM uh, when we um, gather sort of in the May, June, we tend to do a gathering um, at Rising Brook. Um, but um, just on a very, uh, there's a number of things that we're seeking to sort of continue to initiate and to do as a, as a network. Um, we had the privilege of being part of the Baptist Together um, CMD sort of webinar. Um, there's there's a, a recorded webinar that gives you quite a lot of information about who Fresh Dreams is, what we are, what we're about. Um, if you're new to Fresh Dreams, then do have a look at that. It's on the Baptist Together YouTube channel. And um, we'll just um, encourage you to have a look at that. There's, there's myself, Amy and Pete were interviewed and just chatted about what we are as Fresh Dreams. So that's a great place to go. It's a great little resource for us to have now. So do have a look at that. Um, also, you may be aware as well that we're partnering with 5Q, uh, which is uh, connected to Alan Hirsch and the book he wrote. There's a training cohort that is uh, going to be starting up. Um, if you, there's still space and time to get involved, if you're interested in joining a year-long cohort of training and equipping around the 5Q material, then uh, do drop me an email. Um, there's an event taking place on July the 8th uh, that you could join. And uh, we do have um, a facility to offer a, up to 50% bursary for that. So if you are interested in finances, a bit of an issue um, for whatever reason, then we can have a conversation uh, to help um, support that. Um, Fresh Dreams has secured a grant from the Mission Forum 
to help them run that particular training. Uh, Pete, just give us a quick heads up on the millennial network that's developing. Yeah, so about a year ago, myself and uh, Mark Hurst, who we've heard from today, uh, and Adrian Cesarini, uh, we had a heart really start gathering people who have that sort of emerging generation of leaders in the Baptist family. And so we've been doing that for about a year now. Uh, we meet every month and uh, we, we gather to just share stories, to pray, uh, catch up. And then also we often hear from different people who will come in and just input into uh, our lives and ministries. And so if you've got anyone who you know who's a uh, sort of a youth millennial very loosely, but emerging leader, whether they be uh, uh, sort of anyone sort of from uh, sort of 20 through to sort of mid mid 30s <laughs> um then if you, they want to sort of get in touch with us we can uh, contact them and just just today it's an informal group of people gathering together just to, to journey together to do life together and just build relationship i really feel one of the key things in this time coming out of covid um is about the the importance of building relationships across the church across different networks across different people so that's what we're looking to try and do in that uh, younger sort of uh, emerging generation of leaders. So if you've got people you might know, you can put in touch with us, please, please, uh, please do that, it'd be great. Thanks, Pete. And uh, just looking ahead um, into the rest of 2021, just picking up a little bit on what Mark um, was saying about prayer. Um, in the autumn, we've always had um, sort of national, sort of regional prayer days, prayer and fasting days. And um, as a team, we're, we're very keen to, um, to keep that going. So we're just exploring in, in, in the autumn to do some sort of regional stroke national. We're, we're just wondering whether we might do as hybrid. We may do something nationally on Zoom just to get together and pray on a particular day. Um, but there might be some options to, to gather regionally as part of that. So do look out for that. Um, it's, it's in conversation and planning at the moment but we are hoping to have something um, in the autumn uh, where we can just pray together in that particular way. And um, we are pleased to announce that we are going to be running a 2022 national conference. And the dates for that are January the 10th to the 13th, 2022. And we are exploring um, doing that as a hybrid conference um, we will meet in person, God willing, um, and we'll be using the Hayes Conference Centre for that. And we're really pleased uh, to have a, a number of people confirmed as speakers. And um, what we're feeling in, in terms of our prayer is that we, we just want to do a little bit of a play on the whole Back to the Future theme. Um, uh, as you know, the film had three films. And uh, we feel like maybe we'll stick with that theme of Back to the Future, but call it Back to the Future 2, um, because we are still be grappling and working out what is God saying to us as we link, look into 2022. And so we're really pleased to have um, Amy back with us, who's also on the call today. So uh, we're looking forward to actually uh, meeting her and having her in person together with Amy as uh, um, Summerfield, who heads up Kyria Network, and uh, we've also secured um, a lady called, um, what's her name, Pete? Sorry, it's gone completely out of my Heli head. Brunt. It's a friend of yours. Say again? Heli Brunt. Heli Brunt, um, who for a time actually was on the staff of Holy Trinity Cheltenham uh, as a leadership consultant, so um, plus a number of other people that we're talking to. So do look out for more information about that uh, conference. And also in 2022, we are um, hopefully going to run our theology school that was postponed in 2020. And we're gonna continue with the theme of human sexuality as the topic that we want to take some time to do some theological reflection on. And that will be in the June of 2022. We're just trying to finalize dates and venue, but do look out for that um, as we go forward. Um, Conscious that uh, one or two people are already leaving, um, and that's fine. We, we, we're going to sort of finish pretty well around the, the sort of 12.30 mark. Um, I guess, you know, obviously there's quite a lot of us on the call. Um, 
there's a number of things in chat that people were reflecting on as they were listening to to Bev and to Mark and to Alex. Um, if there was anything that anybody wanted just to um, say, there might be a moment to do that, but we will need to be quite disciplined to do that, or you can just stick something in the chat. Um, I'm also keen, just for the last few minutes, or the last seven or eight minutes, we'll just jump back into those breakout rooms so we can pray for one another and just pray together as we continue to go through this season and uh, continue to pray and listen um, to God. One of our real hearts as a network is that we want to be a place where we can give courage to one another. And um, we do need that courageous leadership, uh, perhaps more than ever. And we need those around us who are also going to be courageous and we can journey together, share together, pray together. And that's very much at the heart of who we are as Fresh Dreams. Um, so if you're able to stay on just for a few more minutes, we'll go into those breakout rooms and just give you some time to pray for one another. If you have to go, that's fine too. Um, but uh, do do stay if you're able to, just for the final six or seven minutes while we pray. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> 